Well, good morning, good morning, one and all. This is the last day of our contract training for the regular contracts, and we are looking at the difference today between as is and bar bar. Probably my favorite part of the training because you guys know I have distinctive feelings about both contracts. So does anybody have, let's share my screen. Does anybody have any questions about anything we've covered thus far in contracts, first of all? No, everybody's a total expert when it comes to contracts. I love that. Okay, so everybody's super quiet now too. Uh, wonderful. <clears throat> Is this how this goes? We're going to be in contracts and everyone, no one's going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. What is happening? Thank you forever. Um, one thing I did want to mention Again, when we went through the contracts, we got up last time all the way through, and I'm in a residential contract right now, all the way through to here, the closing costs, right? Ah, wait, where are we? Where are we? Good God, this is just not playing nice, is it? No, 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 I'm way past it, way past it. Please hold, goodness. This is not playing nice, right? Like now it's frozen. All right, we're going to go over to the as it, what the hell? It's not playing nice at all. It's like frozen. You guys? I, what is this? I cannot move my contract. Oh, now it's starting to move. And because I am super impatient, <laughs> I know. No one could believe that to be the fact, right? Carrie, impatient? What? Okay. Let's just jump on in. Here we are. When we get to the closing costs, guys, this is where they change. Now, I want to talk a little bit about anybody who's not taken this class with me may know the answer. Anybody who has taken this class with me probably knows the story, but we're going to talk about it anyway, because we do have some new people that have not taken the class with me. Um, just where the difference when far as his contract came about. Do you know, Oksana, where the as his contract came about? See, a lot of people don't know the story. Care, do you know the story? No, I don't. It's a story. No, I'm just <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, prior to the crash, actually, in 2007, 2008, when that happened, there was no as his contract. So anybody who was in the industry before that, I started in 2004. There was no as is contract. There was no such thing. This was the contract we used because when you want to buy a house, right? You're going to get an inspection, right? You want to know what's wrong with it. So see this little part here that we're going to talk about? What this is doing is it's saying you're going to have an inspection and it's going to have general repair items. You're going to have probably a WDO. We're destroying organisms and, you know, inspection. And to make sure that there's no permits needed, right? Maybe they did some work and never had permits or never closed permits. So we're going to do those kinds of things. And if we find that those permits or those WDO or general pair items are needed, we're going to pre-negotiate um, you know, with the buyer and seller prior to that, how much they'll be willing to pay ahead for the seller. And then if it comes back, that the costs are more than we anticipated. Well, now we can get into this negotiation period and decide, okay, is the seller gonna pay more? Is the buyer gonna pay more? Are they gonna split it? Or if we can't come to terms, well, then we can get out of the contract, right? Because that's how we did real estate. Well, what happened was the crash, right? Because everybody who could, well, breathe, fog a mirror, got a loan, right? And so people were buying homes that had no business buying homes, were buying four and five homes that had no business buying the first home to begin with. They were qualifying what, based on, I love the pick-a-pay loans. Those are my favorite. Does everybody know what a pick-a-pay loan is? Mm -hmm. Super, of course, Maria knows. A pick-a-pay loan was pick how you wanted to pay, that they actually called it a pick-a-pay. So it was, you had 30-year, 15 year, you had an interest only loan, or sometimes 1%. Sometimes they gave you multiple, right? I mean, there was multiple different choices. It was actually, um, you have the fully amortizing interest only or negative amortization. You so whether which, you want to actually pay a full payment, whether you want to just pay interest only and still owe the same amount after however many years, or you don't have 
have to go even what is owed. And then we will add it to your principal. So negative amortization means like you're paying maybe 1% interest. Well, guess what? 1% was never the interest. So that means that let's say for fun, you borrowed 100,000, but you never paid enough in your payments to even equal that. So at the end of the year, instead of that 100,000 being 99,000, because let's face it, you really never paid much off anyway. Now your loan is 105,000. That is your loan is actually growing. And so the payment, let's say, was you know supposed to be on a 15-year, let's say, should have been 2,500. On a 30-year, let's say, it was 2,000, right? But on an interest-only loan, let's say it was 500. All right, I mean, I'm kind of making those yeah. numbers up, but let's say, right? Because they weren't paying near enough to even cover the interest. So these people were getting qualified to buy this on $500 a month. They could never afford to pay $2,000, 2500 Oh, yeah, income. Oh, this was some stated loans, yeah. so, right? And this was like the DSCR loans, right? Yeah, yeah. Tell us how much you make. Sounds good. We like it. Do you have a job? Great. We are not going to rent You're a job. You're a job to me and you make $150,000. <laughs> yeah. Right. We know housekeepers at Disney make one hundred and fifty. dollars Yeah. Do you breathe? You're in, excellent. This is your third property, fabulous. I'm sure you can rent it. This is what was happening. So when we had this oversupply of homes where people owned five of these for $500 a month, and then the banks realized, uh-oh, we're in a little bit of trouble. We need to call out back those loans and say, you can't pay at the $500 or even the $1,500. You now have to pay the 30 year or more. People are like, I can't pay $2,500 a month or $2,000 a month. So what do they do? Well, guess what? They never put any money down anyway. Yeah. And even if it was a jumbo loan, no worries. We'll just give you two loans. We'll give you a loan to cover the first and a loan to cover the second. So what happened is people had no skin in the game. No money down. When we say no money down, they meant no money down. And they weren't paying enough to even cover any of the principal. So what did they all do? They walked away from the homes, which is why it's totally different than where we are now. We don't have enough inventory at all for all the people who want to buy it. Back then we had so much inventory and not enough people to buy it who actually could qualify for a loan, right? That was a very different scenario. So the banks had all this inventory and they were in the business of selling homes, right? So what do they do? They say, take it, take these homes, but you're buying them as is. We're not changing anything. We don't care who owned it. We don't care if they really did own it. We don't care what's wrong with it. We don't care if there's a refrigerator. We don't care if there's even toilet bowls in the house. You're buying it as is. And that's where the as is contract came from. Now what's happened since the introduction of the as is contract is it's become this horrible, really crazy version of what it was supposed to be. If you think about what as is should mean is you're buying the home as is you get in the price should reflect that you're purchasing this home as is right you can get an inspection if you want one but the but the seller shouldn't ever say that they're going to do anything right because there's nothing in this contract works we're going to look at that says they're going to do anything right there's no renegotiation part of that contract but that's not how realtors decided to use this realtors decided to say well we have an inspection period which we're going to look at inspection period for five, seven, 10 days, whatever. And we're going to renegotiate this whole contract. We're going to completely come out of the contract and hold the seller's ransom. Now imagine back in those days when we had all this inventory, the sellers were desperate to sell their home and the buyers would come back and say, there's so much wrong with this home, whether it was true or not. You have to give us $8,000, $10,000, $12,000 or we're going to cancel right? Long laundry list of items, or just tell us how much they wanted. And the buyer, the poor sellers would be like, oh my God, I can't go back on the market. It's a scary place, kind of like a dating pool, right? And so they would just, <laughs> they would just do it because they were scared to go back into the, you know, home, putting their home back on the market again. And that's what has happened to the as-is contract. That is not what that contract is supposed to mean. Okay. And if it were me, and if I were going to allow for an as is contract, I would write under additional terms, buyer and seller agree. This home is being sold as is. Buyer can have their inspection, but will not ask the seller for any concessions and seller will not give any concessions. 
either in repair or in price. And you know what will happen? The agent on the other side will have a heart attack because I guarantee you the agent never explained the ISIS contract like that. Because this is how the agents explain it. No worries. We'll go in and then we'll have the inspection period and we'll ask for whatever we want. And we'll renegotiate the contract. What is a contract for? Anybody? It's for the buyer and seller knowing 100% black and white how this entire process is supposed to go from beginning to end, right? All the details of this process. If you're coming out of contract, how is that supposed to be the contract? You're trying to interrupt the contract, completely come out of contract to renegotiate the contract and then get back into contract. That's exactly what they're trying to interrupt the contract, completely rewrite a contract and go back into contract. That's what uh, agents were doing. Does that make sense? And here's the fun of it. Agents like to rewrite it themselves. <laughs> and are they a agents, realtors? Are, are they uh, attorneys? No, but do they pretend to act like one on TV? Yes, really, really bad. So like my favorites, you know, I, I still love, you know, now they're so stupid they don't make any sense, but my, my favorite when they would write things like the home must appraise. Really? What does that mean? Really, it must appraise. When? For how much? And what happens if it doesn't? Who's gonna pay what? That means nothing. Agents write stupid stuff all the time in your contract. It's ridiculous. And so when an agent decides to come out of contract and rewrite a contract, most of the time those contracts are not even enforceable, by the way. I want you to know that. So this is the problem of the as is contract. You come out of what the attorneys have written. You decide to rewrite it yourself when you're not a lawyer. And then we hope it's going to work out. Super fun. So you with me where that comes from? Okay. But do I think there's a place for both of them? Yes. And we're going to look at why. Okay. So we see that in the residential contract. I love this. It says right here. We have here the amounts where they said, if left blank, it'll be up to 1.5% of the purchase price for each of these different items. Or the buyer can write in a, a dollar amount or a percentage of the purchase price for how much the seller will have to pay based upon the inspection report, okay? So let's say for fun, our average sales price here is 700, let's say, right? And one and a half percent, that's 10,500. That's a lot of things that you can get taken care of for 10,500. You guys agree with that? But it can't be cosmetic, right? We haven't gotten there, care, but I love that. Thank you. You know why I love this contract. Okay, now let's continue on. We're gonna go on and on. We're gonna skip all this other stuff for now because all this is exactly the same. But what we're talking about right now is the difference between the as is and the far bar. Oh my God, it's stuck. Okay, keep going. Now we're gonna go right here into what this truly means to have an inspection. We're still in the residential contract. <laughs> we'll get there in another year. It's going a little slow. Oh, I skipped it. Where did it go? Uh, Dispute resolution, buyer default. How did I skip it? Escrow. Okay, here we go. Oh, I skipped it right here. WDO. Ah, okay. Here we are. All right. Let's look at the inspection. Inspection period. Buyer shall have, if left blank, up to 15 days after the effective date, right? To have within which time the buyer at their expense can conduct a general WDO and a permit inspection as described below. Now, this is where it's important. If the buyer fails to timely deliver to seller written to notice or report, what is the report? The actual inspection report. That is a summary report from the inspector. 
who doesn't love that? I don't want your list of stuff. I, you're, are you an inspector? No. You ask for the actual written report from the inspector. If they fail to deliver that within the timely notice, that's within the 15 days, seven days, whatever that inspection period is, then the seller no longer has to have an obligation to repair, replace, treat, or remedy up to that dollar amount. So let's say Carrie puts in an offer as a buyer to Oksana. She left them blank. Oksana missed it. It was a $700,000 offer. They have up to $10,500 on general repair items. Carrie didn't get in the report on time. It was supposed to be seven days. And day nine, she gives you the report. It's too late. Inspection period's gone, right? Now, if she gets the report into you by day seven, it doesn't mean like in a regular as is contract, everything has to be negotiated by day seven if that's the day, right? Because you only have whatever that time period is. All you have to do, Kara, is get that report into her by day seven. Nothing has to be decided past that. All it has to be done is you have to have gotten it in there by that time period. Does that make sense? And you're not asking for anything yet. No, because you're giving the report. Just the, the summary report. You can give the full report if you want. Listen, if I'm on well, the other side, I don't want it. Notice, though, can it just be these are the things? Yeah, and you're not going to want that written notice. If I'm the listing agent, I'm going to request the report from the inspector. And if and it I'm necessarily mean you're asking for all this stuff yet, you're just saying giving well, notice that this is what this about. is the report that we have. And I'm going to explain to you why it's important because notice the words repair or replace. Okay. But the important thing is here, let's look here at the as is really quickly. We need to understand the difference here, guys. This is so critical that you understand. The, there's pros and cons of both. Mostly, you know how I hate this one. But anyway, this is the as is. Property inspection. Notice what it says. Right to cancel. Really, the inspection clause in an as is only the right to cancel. It's a cancel for any reason clause. That's all this is. It's a cancel for any reason clause. So it says the buyer shall have, if left blank, 15 days after the effective date, sounds exactly the same, with which to have such inspections of the property performed as the buyer shall desire during the inspection period. If buyer determines in buyer's sole discretion, <clears throat> that language is right out of the land contract, right out of the commercial contract. It's in the buyer's sole discretion that the property is not acceptable to buyer. The buyer may terminate this contract by delivering written notice. Okay, the rest of it is that if they ruin the property in any way, shape, or form, that they have to bring it back to that, obviously, in any way that it was before. And then everybody is out of the contract. So what is this saying? Did it say that they had to have an inspection? Did they say that the inspector had to be licensed? Did it say it couldn't be their brother, their mother, their uncle? Did it say they had to tell you why they're canceling? No. Did it say they couldn't wake up, say the sky's blue and I don't want to buy your home anymore? I had that happen. People would say, I just don't want it anymore. And they can. Because it is a cancel for any reason. They do not have to tell you why they're canceling. They could just say, I don't want it. Now. Let's say they were supposed to get the deposit into you in five days and it's day seven and they cancel. Can they just cancel? What do you guys think? They have a cancel for any reason clause, right? Yeah. No, they're in default. So in truth, it's very rare I've seen this happen, but the seller, if they so chose, could go after them for the deposit because they're in default of not putting the deposit in. I've really seen this happen more in commercial when it's been a lot of money on the line, but the buyer is in default of contract for not putting the money in. The buyer should put the money down. So you need, the point here is if they're gonna cancel, either cancel before the money is in or put the money in and then cancel. But because we're all scared of escrow disputes, right? Make sure you cancel before the escrow money is due. 
I have seen this year in a residential contract where the escrow money, and we were on the buy side. I mean, no, we were on the sell side, sorry. The escrow money did not come in, in time, and it was an as is contract, and they tried to get out with the, in the inspection period, and the seller is going after them for the deposit. It's a very high, I don't know, $2.5 million property, and they can. Because, and they will get it because the buyer's in default. Mm -hmm. Now, what will happen, then they have a right to cash. So I don't really know how that'll play out in court, right? Because I'm not an attorney. But the truth is the buyer was in default before the buyer canceled. So really, if you played that out in court, which I'm not an attorney, but if, if you think it logically through, they were in default before they tried to cancel. So how can they exercise a right to cancel if they're already in default? So it's almost like they gave away their right to cancel by being in default, which is exactly what the attorney for the seller is stating. I don't want to be there, right? If we're representing the buyer. So my point to you is always make sure if you're representing the buyer that they get their deposit in, even if they want to cancel or make sure they cancel before their deposit is due because sellers can go after that. And if we get into a situation where it becomes more of a buyer's market and sellers get a little more desperate, they may go after that. And if you have a very smart listing agent, they may understand that about the contract, especially if it's one of ours. So <laughs> just know that, yeah. And if, a, if one of our agents asks me that, I have to explain that, that is true, they can. I don't want to be part of it, right? But that's the reality. That's what the contract said. So everybody clear on that? Okay. So now let's go back to the residential contract. So now we understand that they, if they want to be able to get the money that they've already predetermined how much the seller would be willing to pay, they have to have an inspection. And as we go down here, they explain in each section that the inspector has to be someone who specializes and holds an occupational license in that area, in Florida. So if you want to get a WDO, not every general light, you know, general inspector holds a WDO license, right? So that's a really important distinction. They have to use an actual inspector who's licensed in each of those areas, first of all. The other thing is they don't have to have the inspection right? If you go into a residential contract, you don't have to have an inspection, but then you are waiving your opportunity to get those monies that have been pre-negotiated. Does that make sense? So we actually had a deal. Was it yours, Kara? I don't remember whose it was. And it wasn't even for a lot of money. It was like $300 or something for general warranty. It was like a really low amount. It was so stupid. But the seller, the buyer, was like an engineer or something like this from Disney, a know-it-all. And they did not have an inspection because they felt that they were as knowledgeable as an inspector. Gotta love that. And so they tried to go after us for the 300 or the 500. They wanted that to be a closing cost. So they missed the inspection period. It was seven days or whatever. They never gave us a report because there was no report because there was no inspection. And then like the week before closing, they said they want the credit of 500 to go towards the closing cost. And we're like, excuse me, what credit? They're like, well, the general warranty repair, we want that credit to go towards closing costs. We're like, uh, I'm sorry, you waived that when you didn't have an inspection. And they tried to say, well, she's like an inspector. She's even higher licensed because she's a general contractor, or engineer, blah, blah, whatever the hell she was, I don't remember. First of all, whatever your title and licensing, licensing is here in the state of Florida, it doesn't matter. You never gave us an inspection report that needed to be given to us within seven days. So whoever you think you are, that's super nice, but we never received a report. So therefore, no, you're not getting the 300 so here's the thing if you say was it you no it was not me. i don't remember who it was so if you deliver the report then when is the negotiation oh you're gonna we're gonna that. get there yeah okay so so now we know that we just have to give the report 
within the time period that you've established as the inspection period. The report must be conducted by a licensed inspector in that spe specific area. And this is the beauty. The report must state, must repair or replace. It doesn't say get brand new must repair or replace and it cannot be it has to be working condition cosmetic does not count so the property condition the house must be free of leaks water damage structural damage ceiling roof fascia soffits exterior interior walls doors windows and foundation that sounds pretty reasonable doesn't it i mean the house should really not leak right sounds good the pool, pool equipment, non-lease, major appliances, heating, cooling, mechanical, electrical, security, sprinkler system, septic and plumbing systems, machinery, seawalls, dockage, watercraft, lift, related equipment shall be maintained until closing in working condition. That means if your refrigerator breaks, you got to fix it, right? Your sprinklers break, you got to fix them. We get that. Now, torn screens, including pool or patio screens, Fogged windows, missing roof tiles or shingles shall be repaired or replaced by the seller prior to closing. Because if your patio screen is torn, what's the point of a screen? It's to keep the bugs out, right? If it's torn, can the bugs come in? Yeah, so it can't function in the way it's meant to function. That's the point, right? Now, the seller is not required to repair or replace cosmetic conditions. Now, the cosmetic condition means there's a bunch of things. So basically things have to be in working condition in the manner that it was meant to work. So here's some cosmetic conditions, which are aesthetic imperfections that do not affect working condition. And here's some of the things, but not limited to. Pitted marcite, tears, worn spots and discoloration on floor coverings, wallpaper or window treatment, God, nail holes, scrapes, scratches, dents, Chips or caulking in ceilings, walls, flooring, tile, fixtures, or mirrors, minor cracks in walls, floor tiles, windows, driveways, sidewalks, pool decks, and garage and patio floors, cracked roof tiles, curling or worn shingles, and limited roof life shall not be considered defects the seller must repair or replace. Guys, how many inspection reports do you see with the stupid pictures of caulking? If I see caulking one more time in a damn inspection report, oh dear God, that's cosmetic. Every time you get it back, you see nail holes, scratches, but everything you've listed here, that's all cosmetic. Now, if it says on the inspection report, talk to the seller, get further ins information, further uh, inspection is required. None of those things are what we're talking about. It must say, must repair or replace. So if you have a crappy inspector who does not know how to do a good job and writes all that kind of garbage, guess what? You don't have to fix any of that. None of that is applicable. Do you not love that? How many times do people see the cracks in the tile floors and they're like, oh my God, all that has to be changed. We live in Florida, the floor settles. None of that has to change, it's cosmetic. All right, even along the outside of the house, it's settling. I can tell you with the builder, it has to be so large to even be considered structural, which is pretty dang large, okay? It's not structural, it's settling. So the point here is almost every item you see in an inspection report, other than maybe electrical box, things of that nature, which would be real, polyvalent piping, you know, <laughs> like that. Those things are all cosmetic. None of those would constitute having for your seller to be able to need to be fixed. So I'm gonna give you an example. I had an agent. She hated this contract because it scared the hell out of her. Now, let me ask you, first of all, I mean, you're getting an idea of all these things. If I, how many times we look into the MLS and it says the seller's requesting as is? A billion times, right? How many times you think if you ask the seller, Mr. Seller, Mrs. Seller, we have two contracts here in the state of Florida. One of them is an as-is contract. So essentially a buyer goes into contract with you, you take your home off the market, seven, 10, 15 days, they can cancel for any reason. It's in the buyer's sole discretion if they wanna buy your home. Or the second contract, 
you take your home off the market, they have to have an inspection by a licensed inspector. You predetermine how much you would be willing to pay for general repairs, WDO, permits and inspection. And then if it comes out to be more, not cosmetic, actual working repair items that you don't have to do new, just make sure that they're working, then you can negotiate that. And you can either pay more, they could pay more, you just can't come to terms and then you can cancel if it doesn't work out. Which would you rather do? Let me ask you, how many sellers are gonna say, I really feel good about taking my home off the market for a cancel for any reason clause? I mean, seriously, do you think any seller is gonna pick that one? Anybody? Of course not. Do you think any agent is asking the seller that? That's writing, the seller has requested an as is. It's the agent who wants that as is because the agent does not know how to work with this residential contract. That's what it is. So here you go. I had an agent. I said, just ask your seller which one they want. So she did find it. And she's like, oh my God, he picked the residential. I'm like, no kidding. Shocker. So she went in with this contract. So she gets this as is, this person came in on as is, because even though you put a residential, what do you get? As is. And she said, I'm sorry that seller has requested residential contracts. As she put in realtor remarks, you have to put it on a residential contract. So they did put it on a residential contract. So it came to inspection and they gave a laundry list of all these items that they want to fix. She said, I'm sorry, you have to give me the inspection report because they put the whole list just like they just like to do. She said, I'm sorry, we need to see the inspection report, the summary. So they sent over the inspection report, which by the way, nothing said must repair, must replace, everything was cosmetic. So she highlighted back this contract. She sent it all back and she said, thanks for letting me know all the things your seller will be doing, your buyer will be doing after closing. We'll look forward to seeing you at closing. Seller didn't have to pay one penny. Buyer's agent was like, what the hell happened here? Because <laughs> they had no idea how to use this contract. But that's the reality. Buyers agents don't know how this contract works most of the time. So even if they put the ten thousand dollars as the limit, if there's nothing that's must that's repair, that's must replace, that has to do with working condition, it doesn't matter. They don't have to pay anything. So if Terry gave you that contract by day seven, mm -hmm. it would not be negotiated by day seven. No. Nope. There were there were actual, you know. So here you go. You have to actually, you would go and get estimates. So the seller has to get the estimates. Okay. And then the seller would present them to the buyer. And then based upon now, if there is a disagreement, you can have another inspection done if you so choose. But basically what happens is if it covers all those items, you don't even need an addendum because all the items are covered. It's fine. But if it goes beyond the amount of what you covered, let's say it says 10,000 and it goes to 12,000, then what Carrie can do is she can give a list of all the things and ask you, the buyer, this is the cost of all those things. Which ones would you like us to handle? And would you like us to do them all and you cover the other amount? Or do you want us to just leave some of them off? And that just has to be done prior to closing. And then can the buyer at that point say, it costs too much, I don't want it? Yeah. And the seller can say, don't worry, I'll pay the other 2500 Or they can say, well, fine, you can get out of the deal. Yeah. If they can't work through the inspection items, mm -hmm. you can always get out of the contract. That's the beauty until, of this contract. Until Closing. Yeah. That's how contracts worked. The whole point is that buyer wants to buy, the seller wants to sell. We're trying to get to the conclusion and make sure that this works. We do have right here, a time period with which we have to get things done. So here, buyer may, oh, let me get to it. Where is it? Here it is, repair standard of assignments. All repair and replacements shall be completed in good workmen like manner and approximately by a licensed person in accordance with all requirements of law. Wait, it gives you a time period. Hold on. Here it is. That's WDO. Let's go back up here. They have it for each one. Here you go. So 
General repairs. Seller is only obligated to make such repairs as necessary to bring into the condition as working condition. Seller shall have within 10 days after the receipt of the written notice with which to have a reported repairs completed, with which to have the repairs to the general items completed at seller's expense or have them estimated, right? Because sometimes you can have them done or sometimes you need them estimated by a licensed person and copied and delivered to the buyer. Because sometimes it takes longer than that. Maybe you have to order items. Maybe that, you know, like if you're in, like Dawn was in this house that was a 2.4 million or 4.2, I don't remember, it was a very high. And it took longer because they had a lot of things they had to negotiate, right? Or have a second inspection made by a professional inspector and provide a copy of such report uh, and estimates of the repairs to the buyer. If the buyer and seller's inspection reports differ and the parties cannot resolve, then they together shall choose to have equally split the cost of a third inspector. So they can do this up to three times if they choose. I've never seen that necessary. If the cost to repair the items is equal or less to the general repair limit, seller shall have the repairs made in accordance to the paragraph. If the cost to repair the general repair items exceeds it, then within five days after the party's receipt of the last estimate, right? The seller may elect to pay the excess. The buyer may um, deliver written notice to the buyer. The buyer may deliver written notice to the seller designating which repairs they're agreeing to to accept the balance of the general repairs and as is condition, condition, and the seller shall continue the maintenance requirement. If neither party delivers such written notice to the other party, then the party may terminate the contract and be refunded the deposit. So 10 days to either say they're done or here's all the estimates. Then after that, you have the other five days, but see, it could go on longer than that depending on Maybe you have to order some items. But the point is, it gives you time frames within to make sure you're moving along, but you don't have to say, oh my God, I didn't do this. And now the contract's falling apart, right? Everybody just has to stay in constant communication. But usually speaking, most of the stuff gets done very quickly. And you say, okay, here's all the estimates. We can do this. We can't do this. It's usually within 10 days. You pretty much know all of those things. Let me think about it. What about... Let's say you're working with a seller and you get the farmer contract, uh -huh. and then they see the portion of the inspection that they're required to pay, let's say the 1.5%, mm -hmm. and they're like, I don't want to pay, you know, I'm not going to be taking care of any. Is so time you counter. Okay. I mean, oh, that's. Oh, the, you, and then you zero it out. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's the beauty. We had, yeah. uh, a, we had an agent who presented this to attorneys. And I said, I want to use the as is. She said, why? She said, because we don't want to spend any money. She said, you can still zero those out. Yeah. And still so, then the buyer's required to actually have a real inspection and actually have some skin in the game. And they're like, a brilliant idea. Yeah. Now, doesn't mean that the buyer can't get out because now if there's anything wrong with the house at all, they have an instant out, right? But they still have to have the inspection. You know what I was just thinking about, though? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if underwriters have to explain this. Because technically, if I have a real contract, uh -huh. a underwriter, real <laughs> an underwriter could say, give me that inspection. It's part of the contract. And then if there's issues, I could just leave. I don't know. I've never seen an underwriter. And maybe I haven't They seen don't it. require. They said they can request the part of the contract. Okay. They're required to have an inspection or not. If they don't have the inspection, then they won't get the money. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Now, the same thing holds true with the WDO. Okay. The same kind of thing. You'll see here that they have to be, and it's very straightforward with WDO. Either you have wood destroying organisms or you don't, right? And here it tells you right here, they have five days after receipt of seller's estimate. Same kind of thing with the time limits, right? To get it fixed and all of that kind of thing. 10 days after receipt of the, the report, same kind of thing. They either have to say, okay, this is what it's, you know, we're going to have it all done, or this is the estimate to get it fixed. You know, same kind of concept. Now, here's the big one, guys. Building permits. The permit inspection, buyer may have an inspection. Again, it's the buyer can choose it or not. It's, and this is to see if there were any open permits, expired permits, or improvements done without permits, okay? 
the buyer has within that time period to have that done. Now, here's the really important thing. The closeout of the permit seller shall have within 10 days after the receipt of the permit inspection to have an estimate of the cost to remedy the permit inspection and deliver that to the buyer. Then at no later than five days prior to closing date, the seller shall up to the permit limit have open and expired permits identify the buyer of the buyer or known to the seller closed. Who's doing it? The seller, right? This is really important that you see this, okay? So the seller has to notify the buyer and the seller has up to no later than five days prior to closing has to have them close. But now notice, if the final permit inspections cannot be performed due to delays of building permits for the improvement of the property, if the final permit per, uh, inspections cannot be performed due to delays in governmental entity, or if the closing date shall be extended up to 10 days to complete such final inspections, because sometimes that's out of their control, you know, sometimes yeah. to get them out there is like a nightmare. But if the cost to close the open or expire permits or remedy any permit violation exceeds the permit limit, then within five days after the party gives the receipt of these estimates, the seller may elect to either pay the excess, the buyer may deliver written notice accepting it in as is condition, or remember the, the buyer, the seller can say no and the buyer can get out. This is a reason that the buyer can cancel the contract. You see the difference? This is really important because when we go into the as is contract, there's a very big difference here. Walk through inspection. No, 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 no. That's not the one. Ah, where is it? It's very close here. Can I skip it? Maybe I did miss it. I think it's seven. <laughs> Let me see. Maybe it's seven. Seven, seven. Seven. No. Subject to lease financing. Possibly paid by seller title evidence. Uh, survey warranty special assessments, disclosure, flood. Permit? Yeah, you saw it? Yeah, it was. Oh, I always pass. Ah, it's so tiny that I pass it. Oh, that's permits disclosure. No, they both have that. No, 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 no. Ah, where is it? Property maintenance, property. No. It's got to be right after here. Walkthrough inspection. Oh, no, it's right after that. Duh, I missed it. Seller assistance and cooperation and close out of our building permits. This is huge, guys. If buyer's inspection of the property, this is an as-is contract. Who is inspection? Buyer. Who is supposed to do it in the residential? Seller. The buyer's property as inspection of the property identifies open or needed permits. The seller has to deliver any plans, written documentation, or information that they know, any knowledge, anything that they have, right? If they have, just so that they can cooperate in good faith with whose efforts? Buyers. The buyer's efforts to obtain estimates of the repairs and the work necessary to resolve the permit issues. The seller's obligation to cooperate with the seller's execution, they have to execute any necessary authorizations. Uh, and that's it. The seller shall not be required to expend or become obligated to expend any money. So if you know your seller has an issue, then you would want it. Exactly. So if you know that your seller did a lot of work and never got permits, first of all, you need to disclose that in realtor remarks, but you better be requesting it as this contract. Because then that falls completely on the buyer. If you're in a residential contract, it's all on the seller, which is probably why he came in on that as his contract, which is why you wrote the additional language in there. Mm -hmm. That can be very costly. Like in Carrie's example, where they put the, the AC, was it AC or what was it? The heater for the pool on the wrong side of the house or something? Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, so that was, I, I had the buyer's side. Yeah. But the Yes. The guy was a builder. The guy was a builder and he decided to do it 
decided to do it on its own, but they had the um, the pool equipment on one side, which there was for the HOA, there was a certain amount of space required. So the pool never got permitted. Yeah, his pool was not permitted. The guy was a builder. You think he didn't know what it was going to take? He'd have to relocate the entire heater to the other side of the house. Do you know how much that would cost to repermit and redo? Well, we ended up, we ended up getting out of it. They ended up getting out of the contract. Before the closing, and we couldn't get the county to approve it. And the county wasn't coming out. And anyway, there was some behind the scenes things with the county that we didn't approve. They yeah, so the point here, guys, is be very careful because that agent who happened to be good friends with the seller yeah. requested an as is contract. Yeah. Now, we wrote into the additional terms that mm -hmm. we have some verbiage in our clauses that make that the responsibility of the seller because they require the as is contract. But if you are going in an as is contract and it's a home that has maybe any work done, your buyer is the one liable for that. And you have to understand, usually your inspection is what, five, seven, maybe 10 days. Do you usually do that permanent inspection in that period of time? No, right? So what happens is you find out later that you have permit issues or things that were never even pulled. Now, is that a cloud on the title? Anybody know? It's not. it's not. So you can close and a title company will close you. Yes. Yeah. Well, what it can do is it can obviously decrease the value of that property. That's because how many people are going to want to buy that property knowing that there's possible permit issues? Not possible, definite. No. No, I would require the disclosure. I'd want to be out there if you knew that, right? But, and did they disclose that? No, you found that in the permit, when right. you did the permit yeah. discovery. Yeah. Mm -mm. I would want to do that. They didn't know that. They well, knew. He was a builder. Yeah, he yeah. knew. Did so, you know, yeah, yes, we, we did. We have a clause in our dot mm -hmm. loop. I will show you where that is. We did get out of it because of the verbiage that we put into the contract. One day before they have to see the mm -hmm. they Yeah. Those, those as is contracts can be tricky because you have to understand that if you got out, if you tried to cancel without having that in there, your buyer will lose their money. That is not a contingency. Mm -hmm. Right there, Sarah. Which one? Seller is responsible to close yep. Seller is responsible to close out all open or expired permits and pull permits for all work not properly permitted prior to closing. And that was on your Under additional terms. Contract. Original contract. Mm -hmm. And then we wrote an addenda once we found out what the actual permit issue was. So you knew there was a permit issue? No, but because we came in on an as is, we didn't feel comfortable with that. So we added that verbiage. Just in general. Yeah. 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 yeah you have to be really careful. If you're coming in on an as is, I recommend adding that verbiage because your buyer is not protected for permits. You add all of that? No. That would be a lot. No. But this one right here is the one that's gonna protect your buyer for open permits. Because more than likely, like I said, you're not gonna be pulling that, right? Until later in the contract. And by the time you do, good luck getting out of that contract because of the permit issue. There are so many things about that as is that I feel sketch about, but <laughs> but the thing is, listen, guys, limited roof life, which you know it cracks me up. An inspector, oh, there's limited roof life here. Are you a roofer? Like, how do you know what the roof life is? You don't know. However, we're having huge issues with insurance right now because of roof life, right? So if I am going in on a, a purchase with the buyer on a house that has an older roof. Because I know limited roof life is not is co considered cosmetic, I'm going to come in on an as is. 
to be honest. And I hate the as is, but I'm going to use the as is because I know that's nothing that can get me out of it. Now, it could help me in the financing contingency because if I can't get financing due to the roof because I can't get insurance, right? Then I can't get, you can't get a loan if you can't get insurance. But what if you can get insurance, but it's $12,000? <laughs> So that's not good either. The seller, and you know, if you're representing the seller, you know there could be possible issues with the roof. You could require that. The resident, I would require the residential. <laughs> yeah. Oh, exactly. So this is about knowing what side of that fence you're on. If I'm in a, a seller with an older roof, I might be requiring the residential contract. Absolutely. And then you would just limit or go back on the percentage. Well, the percentage. well, yeah, but the point is, you know, you could say oh. then at that point, I would say, if, if, for example, if we know that Premier Concierge Insurance will do insurance for that home, I would be putting that under realtor remarks that with Premier Concierge Insurance, they can get insurance on this roof so they don't try to throw that at us, right? Because they may try to use that against us and then the seller's requiring a residential contract. But if I know it's a 50 year old roof, then I'm coming in in the residential contract, you might as well add for cash at that point because you know financing, they're never gonna get it from anyway, right? So you can come in the residential contract, but you better come in cash because it needs a new roof. Or you could say, come in financing, but they're gonna have to do a new roof probably prior to closing. And how are you gonna do that? Because most lenders are not gonna allow for them to you know, have the buyer put the money down for the roof prior to closing, right? So, I mean, realistically, you can have an issue there. So that's the thing I would probably, then you might have to go in as is. So it just depends. But this is where you have to know the difference between why you'd use one over the other, right? It's just a better contract. The whole point of a contract, guys, is black and white. So the buyer and seller understand what's happening. Right. The as is is here's a general idea of how this contract's going to go, and the buyer can cancel for any reason, right? And um, and then we're probably just going to come in and tell you all these things that we want, and you could just decide whether you want to continue or not. What is that? Is that really? I mean, what the heck is that? Let's just play a game now. An as is. Well, for example, let's say it's an investor property that has a lot of things wrong with it. You're not coming on a residential contract. You need an as is on that. Um, you know, let's say um, there's going to be some certain issues like that that you might know. But if I know, for example, that I have open permit issues, I'm going to require a residential for sure. I mean, as is for sure, because the as is going to put the onus on the buyer, right? So in that instance, I want an as is because I want the buyer to be responsible for the open purpose. Now I'm going to, I'm going to put in realtor remarks, open permits. I'm going to disclose that because I'm going to be very upfront about it. We had a listing, again, a freaking builder who did a whole beautiful outdoor kitchen, which wasn't permitted. Now, if the builder built it and didn't permit it, do you think it was permittable? Of course not. Because if it was, he would have permitted it, right? And this was like over a $1 million property. So if we know that, you know, so he wanted us to sell it that way. It's not that we can't, right? It's not illegal. But realistically, if you're talking about an open kitchen, you're talking gas, you're talking electric. In this case, it was even water because it had a, you know, sink. Lord knows what parts of it were bad. I don't know. So, you know, we put out there in Realtor Remarks, that there was a beautiful kitchen, outdoor kitchen, not permitted. Would anybody want to buy that? No. <clears throat> so we ended up having to take it off the market so he could take out the kitchen for us to sell it. I would disclose it because that's who we are. By realtors, we're ethics, code of ethics. Yes, you need to disclose that. Absolutely. They are dis disclosures are completely required in Florida. The state of Florida requires that sellers provide a written disclosure of anything that they know that could um, negatively impact the, pro the value of the property. Absolutely. That is a requirement. They're not required to use our form. 
right? They can put it on any piece of paper they want, but they're required in the state of Florida to legally disclose in writing. Absolutely. Because if they don't, that's the only thing they're going to sue for. Lack of disclosure. As a matter of Carrie, fact, uh-huh. Carrie, can I just ask you, is, are you saying that if somebody adds an outdoor kitchen, it's not possible to get a permit for it? Oh, no, it's totally possible. This builder just did such a bad job that he couldn't get a permit on it. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I don't know what he did wrong, but, and he's a builder, so he knew what he did wrong. I just, we didn't know what he did wrong. It looked beautiful, but it obviously was illegal, Janice, you know what I'm saying? So he had to take gotcha. it out. He, he did some things wrong. I don't know what it was, but it was either something with the gas or the electric. I don't know, but it was not something I'd want to have any part of keeping in my house, right? <laughs> so, gotcha. yeah, thanks. So, but you definitely need a permanent outdoor kitchen for sure. Mm -hmm. You're 100% right. Yeah. So, but this is uh, important stuff that we understand the differences. But yes, to answer your question, Oksana, in the state of Florida, it is imperative that you disclose. And as a matter of fact, we have a situation right now where we were on the buy and the sell side and the work it's going to be outside of us thank god but the buyer is going to sue the seller because they feel that the seller withheld information about they felt like they didn't actually do all the things that they said they had done and when they moved in the house all of the stuff kind of backed up the sewage and all this stuff and now they can't even live there yeah so now they're going to sue the seller because they said that they didn't disclose all that Thank God we're not part of that because remember, as realtors, if that is not something you can actually readily see, which how would we know about the back? And they paid for a septic um, inspection, right? So I don't know how they would have seen that or not seen that, but thank God that has nothing to do with us. But we can't readily see that. But let's say we could have readily seen something. Like let's say we saw there was a big black mark on the roof and we didn't say the ceiling, we didn't say anything. And then they painted it. And we didn't also say anything about that disclosure. They could sue us too. We could be sued for non-disclosure just as much as the sellers because that's culpable negligence. It's really bad. So we all have to be really careful if we see something that we also know needs to be disclosed, we have to disclose it. If it's something that's readily available, that's part of the code of ethics as well. Everybody good with that? No, disclosure is huge. It says it right on the listing agreement. There's a little part where they're supposed to disclose if they know anything that could be uh, a deterrent to the value of the property. But the reality is we have the seller's disclosure. They might as well use that because it's got really great place for them to put that stuff, right? But they don't have to use that form. We want them to use that form, but they have to disclose in writing. Do you recommend putting the seller's disclosure? I've seen it on a lot of the contracts that they do where they check the box for one of the agenda of the seller's disclosure. I personally don't like to see it because then it could open up a can of worms. I don't think you need to incorporate it into the contract. No. I mean, you, you know, we all have it. Everybody wants to get it, but I don't think it needs to be incorporated I with the contract, yeah. especially for the lender. Mindset. Yeah, I agree with that. No, there's certain things you need to incorporate with the contract, like addendas and things that are really specifically part and parcel to the contract, but I don't think it's seller's disclosure. I mean, that can come after. It's like an HOA doc. That is part of it because it's it's actually written in the contract, right? But I don't think a seller's disclosure needs to be part of it, especially for a lender. <laughs> Great question. All right. Any questions? I'm going to stop my share for now. I think we had some fun with our as is versus far bar. Anybody questions with contracts? I think we've had some real fun with our contracts for the last three sessions. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Yeah. yeah. Everybody knows how to use an as is versus the residential. It sounds like you have to really know your buyer and know your seller. You do. And what size you're on to figure it out. Well, that's true because they each have a value. But what I hate is that people take the as is and they try to use it for everything. Mm -hmm. And that's the worst because it's not supposed to be used for everything. But there is a time and place for it. Right. Like if we have a seller who has open permits, like if I have somebody who God help us edit a bedroom in their garage, <laughs> you're never getting a permit for that, guys. Never. Nobody. Unless you were the builder who did it before you ever had a car in there. But if there was any noxious fumes that ever lived in a garage, no governing body's ever going to give you a permit to change that to a bedroom. Yeah. For noxious fumes. 
oh my God, make sure that thing is permitted. I'd like to know what governing body gave them that permit because the problem of the, imagine all the fumes that have lived in that garage and now you're gonna have somebody sleeping there. I mean, what did they do to get rid of all the fumes that lived in that garage? Yeah, bad news bears. And I bet a lot of those have not been permitted. <laughs> That's so bad, so, so bad. So, well, thank you all for being here. Very, very excited to see everybody. <clears throat> Please, if you haven't signed up, make sure you sign up for what you're going to bring to our Giving Thanks Luncheon on the 14th here at Dr. Phillips and on the 17th at Lake Nona. Let me know you're coming because I'm trying to figure out how much turkey to get because I think I might know where to get it. Yay! <laughs> all right, guys. See you later. Have a great day. Thank you.